my recording set up. I forgot to actually hit record. Thank you, thank you. Uh, thank you, thank you for bringing that to my attention. I was bragging about my recording abilities and then I actually forgot to press record. Okay, so now we got it on camera. I am recommending that you all don't get upset with yourselves about silly LaTeX uh, experience issues like the one presented in front of you. Instead of putting dollar signs just around the intersection symbol, you should put dollar signs around the whole thing so that the sets themselves are put up in fancy math notation. Okay, we are moving on. Here comes, let's get rid of this, some more LaTeX tips, I guess. So someone else asked on Piazza how you can get this symbol such that you can put some sort of fancy subscript on it and do something like that. So the way you'd get this in LaTeX is by going cap underscore, and then everything here is gonna show up in the underscore. So notice it's more than one character. So the way you capture that is by putting in curly braces, whatever you want in the subscript, and then a caret that is supposed to be shift six, shift six. And then you can similarly have these curly braces after the caret, so you could put an entire expression up here. But this way, by having the subscript as an expression and the superscript not an expression, you see both versions. You can go underscore an entire expression in curly braces, or you can go superscript and have an entire expression in curly braces or not. And then A underscore I. Okay, follow up questions on that one. For mine, they're slightly off to the right. Is that fine? Yeah, so you might be trying to do this in display mode. So you have like $2 signs, or maybe you have this sort of thing. No. Oh, OK. Well, let me see if my next uh, answer will help resolve your issue. This is technically for inline math. And if you're going to use display math, which I thought was going to be your issue there, Jacob, you'll use big cap. And that will make this a little bit bigger, more pronounced. I think that should set things fully underneath it when you're in display mode. Now remember, you get to display mode with two dollar signs in R Markdown or with slash brackets. Did big cap work for you, Jacob? They're still slightly to the right. Hmm. I don't know what to say about that. So we'll go, yeah, that's definitely OK, since we can't seem to fix it. <laughs> I'll investigate that later if you remind me, but I'm going to forget by the next, by the end of the next 50 minutes. OK, I'm erasing when quicker. Double, when I yeah. double dollar sign, it doesn't come up with anything. What about if you use these? Wait, when you double dollar sign. OK, we're shifting gears. I'm going to go into our studio myself and address this one. It it looks right on the knitted side, but on my code, it looks different. Oh, so when I double dollar sign, then it's on top. But if I single dollar sign, then they're to the right. Correct. That's the difference oh. between display mode Okay. is the double dollar signs, or you can do the slash bracket, or okay. inline, which is just with single dollar signs. Great, great. Other follow-up questions on this one? We typically just use inline with one dollar sign for most of our you, notes. You know, if you are writing your math within a sentence, that is most common. Oh, but okay. sometimes you want to put something right in the center of the page to really like emphasize this is a, an equation you should pay attention to. And then you'll use display mode. But Jared, I'm leaving that up to y'all. That's like a, 
like a personal preference sort of thing. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah, sounds good. Okay. Here we go. Here's the third. Promised you three. I'm going to deliver. Okay, the third goes like this. All within dollar signs, say you want to define a set. To force these curly braces to show up, you need to backslash them. To force these curly braces to show up, you need to backslash the curly brace. Now, the reason for that is uh, mostly computers are not smart. But a closer to the answer, uh, closer to the real answer is LaTeX doesn't know when your curly braces are meant to define some like function like math BB, and you're going to call math BB on the element N, on the argument N, or when you're using the curly braces to define a set. So we need to tell LaTeX when you're using the curly braces, not for like a like to define the arguments to the function math bb, but literally for like the visual representation of the curly braces. Okay, so those were the ones that came up in office hours on Friday the most. I'm going to try to be better in my videos about indicating the, um, appropriate LaTeX for the symbols that I draw, but you all are going to find out, like I found out the hard way um, from our first or second week of notes, that I'm rather concise when I give you the notation you're going to need. Like I was pretty consistently just doing this, and so I learned what people ended up doing was putting literally that in their notes and surrounding it by two sets. But you all are going to gain experience and understand that these dollar signs should be moved out of here, even if I just give you this line of code, this line of LaTeX. So we'll get there eventually. There's just experience to be had in LaTeXing, and we'll get there. So good job, all keeping up with your LaTeX as we go. You'll be experts by the end of the semester, including those of you that grumbled about LaTeX early on this semester. Okay, other follow-up questions? Hey, Edward. Um, how do you do a line break? It, okay, so that, I guess, depends on what you mean. Uh, Jonathan, I think that was you. Mm -hmm. There are, if you just need like a new line and you want space between two lines. Yeah. Just like that. Um, put two, hit enter twice after this line with your cursor here, hit enter twice, and then start typing. Oh, that's it? Yeah. Okay, cool. Okay, great. Good question, excellent question. What else we got? Okay, then onward and upward. I'm going to finish my discussion about um, sets and functions, but we had made it to a point where I was pretty much ready to talk about functions, and then I was gonna relate those back to sets. So what we're gonna get today is functions, and then I will relate our new notation for functions back to our understanding of sets. And we're gonna use these two tools to help us better understand, y'all ready for this? a set of functions that are particularly interesting to statisticians. We're not going to get to these functions too much today. I'll say a little bit about them at the end, but they're going to be a big topic for the better part of this course. So we're going to introduce this notation for functions that's going to help us understand better the set of functions that will be interesting to statisticians in this course. So if you have a function named f, I'm going to start encouraging us to think of functions as maps from one set 
to another. So in this case, this would be a function named f that carries elements from the set s into the set t. One visualization for this might be here is the set s and here is the set t. And if you had an element named x, because I'm oh so clever, it might get mapped into the set t like that. And this is what the function f does. OK, so this isn't too far from what you all have been trained to think about functions. So let's just do a quick example, even if my grid is not completely square. And here is going to be my, don't make fun of me, best rendition of x squared drawn on a computer. If we were on a blackboard up here, I'd draw you the best x squared you ever saw in your life. But here on a computer, oof. OK, so here we go. Let's take the element 2 from the set s. And the function f is going to map it up to, now think on the vertical axis, your set t. And it's specifically going to map you to 4. So that's like over here is the element 2. And we're going to go way over here to the element four. And you all are smart, so we could do this again, right? Four is going to get mapped to? 16. Thanks, Jacob. Y'all are going to have to stop relying on Jacob soon here. Four gets mapped to 16. So there is a function f with an example under our new notation and related back to how you might think of functions before this new notation. Now, the reason I like this notation is because in the world of statistics, the domain that is the function from which elements are mapped, from which elements are mapped, the domain is going to have special properties namely for different functions in this set of functions that are interesting to statisticians, the size of the domain is going to be important for us. The size of the domain is going to be important in the world of statistics for this special class, for the special set of functions that are interesting to us. Further, whoops, I can't spell. Further, there's going to be properties of the codomain on this special set of functions of interest to statisticians. There's going to be special properties on the codomain for this set of functions that are interesting to statisticians. So we're going to need these two pieces. We're going to need this notation. We're going to need to understand um, some properties of the domain and some properties of the codomain. Next, we're going to get into the properties of the domain that are going to be interesting for this set of functions, specifically the size of sets and how we can define that si uh, the size of sets. So let's give it a go. We are going to define the size of sets relative to this definition of functions, one-to-one -one functions. Let's see if I can write this. One-to-one -one functions. A function is one-to-one, -one, or sometimes people use the word injective, if every unique element of the domain is mapped to a unique element of the codomain. OK, so let's try some quick pictures that are very informal 
but should give us a way to think about this. So let's put in this first box a picture that'll help us think about one-to-one -one functions. And I'm just gonna keep with the sets S and T for the domain and the codomain. This is a reasonable picture of one-to-one -one because every unique element in S gets mapped to exactly one unique element in T. Edward, would you call that like address kind of thing? Like one element has one address or like it's just an element is equal to an element. Are you trying to put this in like computer science language? <laughs> not, not, I mean, it was happening without me intending for it to, but I'm just trying to. What do you like, mean by address? basically the computer science version of it, but I'm trying to kind of paraphrase what your picture means. And so if you're saying it's, it's just one element is equal to another element in another code domain. They're not equal, they get mapped to. Right, so that's, that's why I think address because you're saying mapped to. Oh, no, they can have, um, mm. they can have the same or different addresses and still have this hold. Okay. So, so it's not a complete- One element is mapped to another element. Yeah. That's what I need to take from this picture. <laughs> we should take it as the value here in S, an element recognized by its value is mapped to another element recognized specifically by its value. Okay, that's helpful, thanks. Yeah, if it doesn't matter where in space these elements are, lo are addressed. It doesn't matter if this is stored in, you know, memory found at pointer element one, and this one's at memory element pointer number two. It doesn't matter what their addresses are, so long as the values that are being carried from one set to the next cool. are unique. Thanks. Yeah. Okay, so let's see if we can use this example of a not one-to-one -one function. Here are two unique elements in the domain getting mapped to the same element in the codomain. Let's see if we can use that to help us understand this function here. Is this function one-to-one -one or not one-to-one? -one? It's one to one. So there's no, each unique element in S on the X axis. It's not one to one. Not Ooh. one to one, because you can have negative numbers. Fantastic. Not one to one. Give me an example. What number could we draw on here that would help us see that X squared is not one to one? Not Jacob. Thank you, Jacob. But not negative Jacob. two. Negative two. Perfect. Negative two similarly gets mapped to four. So there is, although my lines are much messier, if you stare at the picture long enough, a similar to picture to what we had before. Indeed, x squared is not one-to-one. -one. We are going to use this definition one-to-one -one, in order to help us understand the size of sets. Are there any questions before I move on? What if it's y squared equals to x, so two outputs have one input? OK. You're thinking of this, right? Um, I'm thinking, isn't it a parabola, but like facing the right? It's like it's okay. a C. 
So you're just thinking of, you want one of my points to be negative, this. Yeah, but it's it's a parabola. Well, okay, but. Yeah, I like that. Okay, sure. Um, this does not pass the function test, the vertical line test for a function. So this is not mm -hmm. a function in the normal sense that we think of a function. It might be a parametric function, but I'm gonna largely avoid those functions for okay. uh, simplicity. So this doesn't pass the vertical line test. So it's not a function, but it's a great thought, right? Cause you wanna identify the symmetry here and you're going for, okay, we have unique inputs to doubling up on the outputs. What happens if we do the other way? It's an excellent tool for thinking. It just happens to not work in this case, but don't let that shy you away from looking for symmetry in other ways uh, in the world of math. That's usually a very powerful tool. Okay, so we're using the definition of uh, one-to-one -one in order to help us identify a definition for the size of a set. And the word we use for the size of a set is cardinality. So if we take the classic example of A, the set equal to the integers, one, two, three, then A has cardinality three. And you know, mathematically, we write that almost like the absolute value of the set. Does everybody know where to find this character on their keyboard? That's not any special LaTeX. Your keyboard has that character built in. It's called pipe. Is it like the same button as the dash on the Mac? You can see I'll like push shift. So dash is horizontal. I'm looking for the one that goes vertical. Shift dash or dash are both horizontal. On the so keyboard, nice. shift backslash. Aha, fantastic, Brendan. It is shift backslash. So um, y'all have already found backslash on your computers because you need to use it in LaTeX when you do things like this. So just hold shift and hit backslash and you will get, nice, thanks Jonathan for typing it in the chat. Um, you'll get the pipe. Uh, symbol. So indeed, this is how you write the cardinality of a set. And so it's super easy in the example we just gave. Let's see if we can extend this a little bit further. A set is said to be countable if there exists a one-to-one -one function named f, because why not, that maps into, so this is the codomain, into the natural numbers. Specifically, we have f that carries you from whatever your set is, let's just call it a, into the natural numbers. And that function must be one to one. I'm gonna give us one more definition. And then I will provide some examples of both the definitions I give. Okay. The next one is going to be the definition of an uncountably infinite set. A 
set is said to be uncountable if it is, you all ready for this? I hate when math does this, if it's not countable. Okay, more specifically, no one to one function between the set and the natural numbers exists. Okay, I'm gonna pause because I see that some of us are taking notes, which is fantastic. I'll remind you that I post these notes, but that's not to say you shouldn't take notes. Taking notes is an excellent way to learn. Edward. Yeah. When you say that a function is uncountable, infinite set and such. A set is uncountable. Yes. Okay. So I'm trying, because when you were going over the countable set, I was mm -hmm. obviously, you know, trying to think how could this not work as well. And in my mind, if like the domain of, let's say your output is infinite, then isn't both both uh, the output and the input going to be infinite sets? Okay, so here's the crazy part that you're identifying. Uh, there are different sizes of infinity. Excellent. And that's okay. what this definition is capturing. It's one of the craziest ideas in the world of math. You know, there's some folklore in the world of math that for like 100 or 200 years, all the mathematicians that studied this crazy idea that there's sizes of infinity, the folklore is that for a long time, all these mathematicians that studied sizes of infinity went insane, every one of them. I don't know if it's actually true, but it's fun to think about. So I'm gonna give us some examples here so we can see. Uh, one quick question. What is the uh, latex uh, code for that? Um that little arrow? Oh, great question. And I meant to say that, but I didn't. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Um, thank you, Gary, for asking. This no arrow problem. can be represented as two slash two. Thanks. So you read it as like A to N. Oh, yeah, yeah. Makes sense. Makes sense. Yeah. I, it, thankfully, that is one of the latex symbols that makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> right. not, not all of them will do that. Uh, great question. Thank you for catching me on that one. Yeah, no problem. Okay, so here we go. Here's an example. Consider the set. I name all my sets A. Isn't that the worst? 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12. All I'm trying to do is list all positive even numbers. Okay, A is a countable set. Because the function f of x equals 2x is 1 to 1. It's almost cute. You know, I didn't actually include zero in here, but it doesn't matter if you do or not. It's not going to change the cardinality of the set in the sense we're talking about. So uh, going back to Josiah's point, this is a set that is infinite. Theoretically, the positive um, even numbers will never stop. You can just keep on adding two and you will just infinitely count positive numbers, but they are one-to-one -one tied to natural numbers by this mapping, as they might say. Okay, there exists a bigger infinity. And that's the craziest part about this idea of cardinality of sets. The real numbers are, is an uncountable set. 
I'm not going to prove why this is true, but I'm going to give us some strong intuition for why this is true. And we're going to see this, consider just the interval zero to one of real numbers. Consider just the interval. Do we all agree that my interval is missing a lot of real numbers? Yes. Okay. But there's already more numbers in this tiny interval of the real numbers than there are natural numbers. And that's going to be the intuition I'm going to show you. There's already more numbers in this tiny interval than there are natural numbers, which is to highlight the idea of infinite coming in separate sizes. Okay, so let's just make a little table here. I'm gonna list a number in the interval, and then I'm gonna list a natural number that we might be able to create a function that says, take me from the number in the interval to the natural numbers. I'm gonna start with zero and zero. Then I'm gonna say, okay, well, 0 0.1 is certainly in that interval, so I might as well map that to the integer one. And certainly, 0, 0, 001 is still in that interval, so I might map that to two. And if I go one, two, three, one, I might map that to three. Well, okay, I can just keep adding zeros, can I not? Is there any point for which I can stop adding zeros and suddenly exit this step? I can just add an infinite number of zeros, right? Yeah, Edward, you totally can. Okay, new question. Can I exhaust all the natural numbers by just infinitely adding zeros to this decimal expansion? Can I no. exhaust all the natural numbers by just adding zeros? No, you can't. Why not? Because it's an infinite. But I can just keep adding 0 0.01, 0 0.001, 0 0.0001, 0 0.0001, 0 0.0001, 0 0.0001, 0 0.0001, 0 0.0001, 0 0.0001, 0 0.0001. I don't know if this thought is beautiful or, or really scary. <laughs> This thought is terrifying because it means there are magnitudes of infinity. I can exhaust the complete set of natural numbers by just this decimal expansion, just by adding zeros. But that doesn't include, it doesn't include numbers like 0 0.2, 0 0.002, 0 0.0002, or three or four or five or six or any of the other numbers in this tiny interval. Not only does it not include numbers like this, it doesn't include any real numbers outside of this interval. So the only logical step people have come to is there are sizes of infinity and the real numbers are a much bigger infinite size than the natural numbers. this is the first time you've seen this idea, you probably hate it. <laughs> Thanks for nodding a lot. But infinity goes on forever anyways. It might go slower to infinity, but what might go infinity. slower to infinity? Like having 0 0.0001. Mm -hmm. They're both in infinity though, so there's no bound. Ah, but if you think of it in like dimensions, think of it like you're thinking out here. So sort of there's like an off to infinity in this direction, right? Mm -hmm. But then similarly, if you don't consider just the interval, now just think of like positive real numbers. It's almost like there's a whole nother dimension here that goes off to infinity within the set of real numbers. But there is no way to imagine that within the set of natural numbers. So it's like the set of real numbers explodes into infinity in multiple directions. And the set of natural numbers only kind of goes off in one direction. Okay, I'm gonna wait in silence for just like 30 seconds more because sometimes it takes people a minute to digest. If you have a question, shout it out.
So is it a matter of considering they're both approaching infinity, but just at different rates? If you relate the two sets to each other, then like zero divided by zero is zero, doesn't matter. But then like you have one tenth and then like you have a number that's getting closer to zero every time because the top is so small. And I mean, like, I suppose I'm just trying to like, if you relate them to each other, is that how you can say it? Or is it just at the rate at which, um, the decimals are approaching infinity before you even get to one. That's the difference. I mean, in this case, it's like before you can even get to zero. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Let alone one. You can do the same game with one. You can do the same game with two. You can do the same game with three. You can do the same game with four. You can do the same game with five. So it's as if you have infinite infinities within the real number. And that's right. why it breaks. Right. Nice all. Thanks for talking. I appreciate everyone's contributions here. I think we learn better even in this crazy environment when we can communicate. And so you all communicating is, is excellent. Okay. I'm moving on. Okay, let's see some examples of this new function syntax. The function sign takes us from the real numbers into the interval negative one to one. That one's not too bad. Arc sign, it's like the inverse of sign is an annoying little function because it seems to make sense that it takes us in the reverse direction from the codomain of sine. It does work like that, but then it throws this curveball on you and only takes you back into negative pi over two to pi over two. Silly little functions these are. Okay, let's try another one. Let A be in a be a set in the real numbers. I'm going to define a function named one underscore a. That is the name of my function. Instead of f or sine or a sine, I'm going to name my function a underscore, I mean one underscore a set. This function is going to take us from the natural numbers to the set consisting of only zero and one. They call this the indicator function. I'll show you why. So if you called this function on an argument named x, this function is equal to one if x is in a, such that the function indicates with a one, indicates when x is in the set. So they call it an indicator function. And it is zero if x is not in the set A. This is going to be a super helpful function for us later on in this class. Y'all aren't going to like it until you see it maybe the fourth time. And then you'll be like, OK, I can deal with that. But for now, meh. OK, this is a piecewise function. Uh, there is a Piazza post currently up that gives you the LaTeX code for piecewise functions. So I'm not going to try to fit it all in right here. It's a little bit more code than you want it to be, but it's not too bad. OK, I'm going to pause for another 30 seconds. Are we doing OK? Okay, then I'm going to spend the last part of this class helping you understand 
what we're going to do in Wednesday's YouTube lecture videos, which are already posted, but I haven't sent out an email because I haven't had time. So once uh, this recording is done formatting, which is going to take like at least a solid hour on my tiny little laptop, uh, I will put this recording in the YouTube playlist, and then I will send out an email of Wednesday's lecture videos. For now, let me see if I can provide some context on Wednesday's lecture videos, which I hope are providing some context for this class. The world of statistics is a big and crazy world. Uses these mathematical and we'll give more formal definitions later on, things called distributions. And they're clever little things they are. I don't know who came up with the idea of these, but they're tricky. And it's my opinion that the world of statistics introduces the word distributions almost too quickly and it leaves students feeling a little contextless about why the world uses these things called distributions. So I'm going to spend Wednesday's cla uh, class lectures introducing us very gently to this world of distributions. I'm going to try to leave it informal, like I'm going to use thingy and stuff and other silly words that don't really mean anything but the mathematical words are often a little bit too frightening the first time you see these ideas. So I'm gonna introduce it like this. These distributions are in one sense, random number producers. They are things, processes that generate data. These distributions are things that generate data. I will often call them processes, but I mean by process is like any events that take place in the world. Consider there are events in the world that produce elephants, and then these elephants grow up to be big and strong and tall, and they have weight the weights of these elephants might as well be considered random numbers because you can't very well predict the weight of an elephant before you see and measure it. So we might as well call it random. But the process that produced these is thought of as a distribution in the world of statistics. And in the world of biology, it's like two elephants to get together, they fall in love, marriage happens, and then they produce an elephant. And then that baby little elephant is all cute. And maybe some wildlife people come and film it. And then that baby elephant grows up and those wildlife people give it a name and bada bing, that elephant has a weight. Whether or not this mathematical thing, a distribution actually produced that elephant or not is beside the point. Statisticians don't care. They're willing to assume, to assume there is this mathematical construct called a distribution such that the world of the events that made this elephant come into existence happened and now it has a weight. We will imagine this distribution thing is a thing that produces data in the world, however that data came to be. Okay, the other piece I want us to think about for this word distributions is the numbers show up in patterns. These patterns are dictated by probability density functions. Now this is going to be a key word for us later on, but for now, let's just take a similarly informal go of this. So these functions are going to look something like this. There's an x-axis, there's an f of x axis, and often we shortcut probability density function to just density. 
when we know we're in the world of statistics, everything is probability something, probability this, probability that. But there's some key takeaways that I want to point out before we get lost in the world of statistics. And I got my eye on the clock because I don't want to keep us over here. These density functions might look like this. Just as a quick example, the way we think about it is zeros will show up more often because they have higher density. Zeros, because they have higher density, will show up in the data the distribution produces more often than would a four because the four has lower density than zero, one, or two. So two is going to show up maybe as a quarter as often as zero is, and one is going to show up maybe as half as often as zero. Now it's going to help you all to keep in, I'm, I mean, it's going to help you, but I'm not telling you uh, to think of these as probabilities. These are not probabilities, but if you need to think of them as probabilities for now, that is okay though I'm going to remind you that density is not probability. But if you need to cheat for now and just think of it as probability, fine. We'll correct the idea later. You're also going to think density functions are distributions, but they're not. And that's also something we will fix later on in this class. But both are closely related. So if it helps you keep these sorts of words in mind, so there's not too much floating around, by all means, please do. But know that we are going to fix these ideas later on in the course. OK, so Wednesday's lecture videos are all going to be about named distributions. You can find. Um, here it goes. You can find more information than you want about these named distributions in either of the textbooks. I don't care which textbook you go in. You're going to find more information than is going to be helpful right now about the named distributions. If you're super excited about these topics, go read. Find the named distribution I present in a lecture and then go look it up. But try not to get too excited because I'm really doing my best to take us through a slow introduction to these topics because I think standard and good statistics books move too quick through these ideas, assuming you know what the hell this world of statistics is all about. And we don't. That's why we're taking the class. Thanks all for your time. I'm going to stop here and let you go because it already looks like I used up uh, one minute longer than I should have for this video. I'll stick around for the next five minutes, but that's about all I can offer to answer any questions people might have. I will stop recording now and then finally be quiet because I'm